Chapter one, you the things you have seen, right? The risen Lord Jesus Christ, the Messiah, the awaited one. That's what we see in chapter one. He's going to give us a description of Jesus, the glorified and magnified and, and the 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 power and the, the just the greatness of Jesus Christ as he's king and Lord over all things, my friend. That's what we're going to see. All right. So then we go into chapters two through three, and we see the church age, the actual church age, which is what we're in right now. And how do we know that? Well, it says here, the things that are. So the seven churches are described in chapter one. And or two and three, actually. But chapter one also gives us what, what represented the seven churches. And that, my friend, is the menorah, the seven golden lampstand, always symbolized and represented the churches. Because we are told that in Revelation, the seven golden lampstands are the churches. And we know that the high priest was always a picture and a foretelling of Jesus Christ. And so the high priest's job, we know that, keep this menorah filled with olive oil so that these fires burn bright, so that the church, right, is on fire for God, right? The church represents God and his power, and and we are filled with the Holy Spirit, which in the New Testament was, there was like these tongues of fire that came down, and the fire would burn in our hearts. It's a good kind of fire. It doesn't consume you, but it it gives you power from God, and it, and it helps you to speak for him and to be kind and, and to represent the Lord Jesus Christ. So it's so good, right? So that's chapters 2 and 3, those that are, the things that are. Okay, so let's look at chapters 4 through 22, okay, right? So then it says to write down the things that are to take place after this. And the Greek word, if you want to get into that, is metatalta, which means after this, what takes place after this, right? So there's the tribulation, then the triumph. And that's what we see in chapters 19 through 22, the very last section of this book. We see the great triumph of Jesus Christ. And that happens after the tribulation. It's like after war, there's always a great peace, right? But it has there has to be a war first. Like after World War II, there was this time of great peace. And it was a time of celebrating around the whole world. In fact, even Israel became a nation again in 1948. And the, the Jewish people were headed back to their homeland. And it was a great moment when the nation of Israel was rebirthed after almost 2,000 years. It was a, a miracle that we got to see in our lifetime or, or our grandparents or maybe your parents got to see. So it's so cool, you guys, to see stuff like this happening in our time. Okay, so we're going to get into chapter one now of the book of Revelation, and here we go. So here it says, this is how it's written, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Now, that word in the Greek is apocalypse or apocalypto, which we get the word apocalypse from. And a lot of people, they they hear the, the book of Revelation and they think, oh, it, it's a great apocalypse. It's it's just a time of, of disaster and, and horrible things that happen. But, but it actually means revealing. It means the revealing, like a like a statue uh, with a cover on it, and someone pulls the cover off, right? Or you're you're at a play, right? A play, and there's a curtain, and then the curtain slides open on both sides, or or goes up, and you get to see what is going on behind the veil, the curtain, and you get to see the picture of what is going on. The what 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 it's a revealing. The book of Revelation is the book of revealing. And it's so awesome because who or what, what is it revealing? It's about who it's revealing. And it's all about Jesus Christ. It's the the revelation of Jesus Christ or Yeshua, the Messiah, if you're in Israel, the Messiah. It's the revealing and it's a close-up look at him. Doesn't that excite you guys? It excites me. This is a detailed uh, version of Jesus, a detailed uh, 
image and, and imagery and symbolic stuff that we're going to see in this, but it all represents real stuff, like heaven itself, the throne. And that's what we see in chapter one, the things uh, that you have seen, the resurrected, glorified Messiah, Jesus Christ. And that's what we're going to look at, you guys, in this chapter. So excited about it. I know you are too. All right. So the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John. And that is John the Apostle. Some people say it was a different John, uh, but if you go back, the farther you go back, the more you see that the church fathers said it was, and it was always believed, it was John the Apostle, the one whom Jesus loved. All right. So, John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed, here it is, guys, blessed is the one who reads out loud the words of this prophecy. Blessed is the one who reads out loud the words of this prophecy. That would be me right now, but it could also be you when you read this book out loud. So I'm being blessed right now reading this book to you out loud as that scripture just said. So let's look at the let's look at the rest of it. And blessed are those who hear, that would be you, and who keep what is written in it. So we must keep what's written in it. We don't want to hide it or take away from it in any way. There's a warning at the end of this book about that. For the time is near. All right, let's keep going. So Again, here's the church age, right? Represented by the menorah, the seven golden lampstands. And that's given to us in these scriptures, you guys. Um, John sees and, he, and, and, and Jesus, or, or it might have been the angel, he describes what he's seeing. He tells them that this is the church. This was always representative of the church. And I believe that it's church history. It's representing uh, not only individually the church, but the churches throughout church history, which is not perfect, by the way. I'm going to throw that out there. We're still sinners, still human beings, saved by God's grace and His mercy, but we are redeemed by, we're purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ. And you can be too, my friend, if you have never given your life to Christ, at the end of this episode, you are going to have an opportunity to do that to where you could be born again, reassured, guaranteed that you are going to go to heaven to be in paradise with Jesus forever, not hell. Because there's two places you go to. It's either going to be heaven or it's going to be hell. And you do not want to go to hell, my friend. The Bible does not paint a pretty picture about this place. And it was prepared for Satan and his followers, his minions, all the fallen angels. It was prepared for them, not for you. But if you choose to go there by not receiving Christ, you will go there. Because basically, God just gives everyone what they want, right? God gives everyone at one moment in time exactly what they want. If you want a world without God, you there's many people like that. They don't want the church. They don't want Christians. They don't want Jesus. And they don't want God anywhere in their lives. They want a world without Him. And God will give everyone what they want. If that's what you want, you'll get it. But that's hell. That's the outer darkness. Uh, kind of like how everything in the universe is 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 oxidizing. That's a form of burning, right? Everything is burning up slowly but surely, everything but gold, actually, which is very interesting because the streets of heaven and the foundations are made of gold. So gold's the only element on the elemental table, the scientific table, that does not oxidize. In other words, a slow form of burning up. But the outer darkness, to me, that describes a place of darkness and burning. And do you want to go there? No. Nobody wants to burn forever in, in darkness by themselves. It's not going to be a big party like some say. It's a place of, of torment forever and ever and ever. But you can also, you have a choice right now. Okay, the age of grace, right? There's, this is about grace, getting something good you don't deserve. You have a choice. You could receive Christ today. 
You could receive him into your life, be born again, because Jesus said you must be born again because you're a sinner, I'm a sinner, but before Christ, I was not covered by his blood. I was not born again to be his child. I had to make a decision to do that at the age of 13, and I did. But you have to make that decision as well. We all must decide at one moment in our life whether you want to be born again as a child of God, belong to him through Jesus Christ, or reject him. Don't reject him, my friend. <laughs> that's that's my warning to you. You know, you don't want to someday find yourself in this place of torment and there's no going back. All right. And Jesus described that place. You don't want to be there. All right. So you're gonna have an opportunity, my friend, again, at the end of this episode, to receive Christ into your life, to be forgiven, to repent of your sins. That means turn from your, your ways of sin and to turn to God and ask him to be your Lord and Savior through Jesus, right? Ask the Lord into your heart to follow Jesus. Okay, let's get back to the uh, episode here again. We're going to see this in chapter 1, the seven gold lampstands. A menorah was always a representation, a picture of the seven churches. Okay, so verse 4. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, that is not like the Asia of today. That means Asia Minor, which is the area of Turkey today. And um, and this area was actually, you know, it's like north of Greece, and it's just the area that back then they called Asia Minor. Okay, so don't get that confused. All right, so grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come. So there's kind of that outline again. We see him who is and him who was and him who is to come. In other words, there's a future coming of Jesus Christ. And from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness. Now, when you see Christ, that is just the Greek word for Messiah. So it's you could say Yeshua Messiah or Jesus Messiah or Jesus Christ. It all means the same thing. The faithful witness, he is, my friend, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. Look at these titles for, for Jesus. The faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth. Now, he's also called the king of kings, the lord of lords. Uh, he's called the prince of peace. He's called the good shepherd. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can go to the Father except through him. That's what Jesus said. There's so many awesome names for him. His name is also Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. We see that in Isaiah, you guys, in Isaiah chapter 9. So good. I love, don't you love these scriptures, how Jesus is described in the Old Testament? We just did a series on that called Road to Emmaus. You can click on that playlist and you can see all the places uh, that we looked together where we found Jesus represented, like Joseph being a type and a picture of Jesus, also Moses and so many prophecies and Psalms. It was just, it was so fun to do that, you guys. All right, so let's get back to the scripture. And uh, and we see the seven spirits before the throne, which we're going to see are the churches as well. He's a king, and he's the ruler of the kings on earth. Okay, verse 5, to him who loves us, and has freed us from our sins by his blood. So important that we see that. By his blood. Okay, the blood that Jesus shed on the cross is what purchased us. And his death uh, made a way for us to go to heaven. And then, and then his resurrection, my friend, being raised up from the dead gave us new life. We are guaranteed to new life with him. And then verse 6, And he made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Isn't that awesome? All right, so verse 7, Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. And that word amen means it's not 
a man or a woman. That's not what it means, right? It means let it be or let it be so. Kind of like that song, uh, let it be, let it be, right? Let's go back to that. So they, every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, let it be so. <laughs> so good. I love that stuff. Don't you guys? So good. Okay, let's go to verse 8 now of chapter 1 of Revelation. Here we go. I am the Alpha and the Omega. So that's the Greek alphabet, right? For the beginning and the end. Says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty Oh my goodness, the Almighty. That's who Jesus is. This is not some small thing here, you guys. This is the creator of the universe. He created everything. He was there with the Father and with the Holy Spirit. The triune God, they were there. They created everything together as one God. It's amazing. And some people have a hard time with that. And, it, and I understand it's, it's very difficult to understand the Trinity or the triune God. Um, to me, the best way to describe this is there's one God, as the scripture said, there's one God. But that one God is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Just like there's one family. Imagine a family of a, a father and a son and a mother. That's one family. You could say like uh, my last name, the Crab family, right? I have two sons, but let's just use this as a picture. The Crab family is one family. There's a father, okay? There would be a father, and then there's a son, right? I have two sons, but imagine when I had one son, there's a son, and then there's the Holy Spirit, and you could say that that could be like my wife, right? So we're one family, but we're three individual persons, three different personalities, my wife is very nurturing, healing, uh, comforting. That's kind of what that's what the Holy Spirit does. Those traits are with the personality of the Holy Spirit, God, the Holy Spirit, comforting, healing. Um, you know, gives you wisdom. Um, my wife gives me lots of wisdom. <laughs> and then the father would be like, the father's like uh, protective. Um, he oversees the family. He's the spiritual leader of the family. But each one of them are still equal, even though they have different positions as far as like authority, they're still equal. And then the son, the son represents the father. And they all work in a triune, in a unity together as one God. So that's how it works. That's a little snapshot of that. A lot of people have a hard time with the triune God. That, and I understand it's it's difficult to understand, but we have to go off of what the Bible shows us, what the truth is. And like in the beginning, the Bible says in the very first words in the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the book of beginnings, which is Genesis, the very first sentence of the Bible, in the beginning is God, in the beginning God. But that word God in the Hebrew is actually Elohim. And I did an episode on that that you can check out. But Elohim is not singular. It means more than one. So we see the three in one God. Elohim. All right? Good stuff, right? So let's keep going, you guys. Now, God, he is omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at once. He's everywhere at one time. He is actually outside of time. And why do I say that? Because Jesus said, I am the beginning and the end, the alpha and the omega. He is not subject to time. God is not subject to time or distance, you guys. All things, remember, all things are subject to God. God can do anything. Through God, all things are possible because all things are subject to him. He does not have to answer to time like many people believe. I mean, you hear people say like, well, how could God have created, the, you know, the earth is uh, 200 million years old and, and we have proof of that. Well, he could have made a mature earth, you guys, real easily. He could have snapped his fingers and made a mature earth. I mean, after all, Adam and Eve were adults, right? When in the beginning there was Adam and Eve and then Eve and they were both adults so perhaps the trees were made mature. The whole earth itself was made at once mature. 
And he may have done it that way. I don't know. I wasn't there. But I know that all things are possible through God. And I know that he is not subject to time. That time is subject to him. All right. So good stuff, right? I mean, isn't it awesome what God did for us on the cross? What Je- You know, he had a plan for us because he knew we were going to mess up that we were going to uh, partake in eating that that forbidden fruit which caused sin to be in our lives but God made a way through his son Jesus Christ and if this speaks to your heart right now my friend perhaps the holy spirit may be gently knocking on the door to your heart as he did for me when i was 13 um and you may need to commit your life to him and be born again. You also may just be, you've walked away from him. You need to renew your relationship with him. You can do that as well, my friend. And he is a simple prayer away. Would you like to do that? Well, you can do that. You can pray right after me, my friend, and and receive Christ and have a new start. Because this is a broken world that we live in, is it not? It's a broken and lost and messed up world. And if you don't know Jesus Christ The Bible teaches that you too are broken and lost. You can come to Christ today, my friend. You can come to him right now or tonight if it's nighttime or morning or whenever it is you're watching this. You can come to Christ by by praying this prayer. You're praying from your heart to God, not to me or not to anybody else. This is a prayer between you and God where you can receive him into your life. Would you like to do that? If you would like to do that, pray this prayer after me, okay? Say these words after me. You are praying to God, all right? All right. Pray it after me. Dear Lord, I know that I'm a sinner, and I'm sorry for my sin. Please forgive me of my sin and help me to turn from it. I believe that you came to this world born of a virgin. I believe that later you died on the cross and you shed your blood for me. I also believe that in three days you were raised from the dead and that you are alive today, Jesus. I choose to follow you as my Lord and as my Savior from this day forward. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Hey, my friend. Amen. If you did that, congratulations. All of heaven rejoices. They're they're celebrating right now in heaven because of what you did, my friend, because of you. So isn't that awesome how much God loves you? Now make sure you get plugged into a Bible-believing church or congregation or fellowship. Make sure you're there with them reading the Bible together. Read your Bible every day. Have fellowship every day and pray every day. Those, this, these are the things that keep you uh, growing healthy with God. Hey, congratulations on your new relationship as a child of God in the family of God, my friend. Welcome. (laughs) All right. Hey, we're going to continue in Revelation chapter 1 in the next episode. Don't forget to hit that subscribe button down below. You won't miss anything. And share this video with your friends. Let's spread the good news about Jesus Christ to the whole world, starting with you, my friend, and sharing with your friends. All right. Hey, God bless you, and God bless his kingdom coming to this world perhaps soon.